This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. On September 21st, the RCMI welcomed its first speaker of the fall 2016 season, Naval Captain Hugh Canoel of Canadian Forces College, who spoke on Canada's part in the longest battle in recorded history, the Battle of the Atlantic. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first, of course, I will have uh, to ask you to bear with the uh, strange accent that I have, uh, which is being encouraged by a few glasses of wine, but I assume it also encourages uh, simultaneous translation, therefore it should be a fine, uh, a fine discussion we're having. Now, to start this, Usually, I would start with thanking the organizers for having me and expressing how much of a privilege it is being here with such an august audience and such things. Uh, but over the course of the last hour and a half, I've just realized that I was ambushed. <laughs> this whole business started with uh, uh, my being approached about conducting or giving a, a bit of a uh, uh, lecture on uh, the Battle of the Atlantic. And the way it was couched to me, and, and all there'll be a bunch of older, rather ignorant army officers. So if you can, you know, brush up your high school uh, PowerPoint on Battle of the Atlantic, you should be okay. And I've since realized that uh, yes, I will be uh, listened to, and then probably challenged by Canadian veterans from the Battle of the Atlantic, by one German veteran of the Battle of the Atlantic. But for this young man over here, an even more uh, dire prospect, being a graduate of the Collège Militaire Royal, who arrived in Saint Jean at the young age of 17 in 1986, and who was confronted by one of the highest ranking, loudest screaming authority at the time, uh, who such person is in this room today, tonight, Monsieur Brulat. <laughs> Obviously at the time it was traumatic, but now of course I realize it was inspiring, <laughs> character shaping, and for that I thank you, sir. <laughs> But no, on a more serious note, obviously it is a privilege being here tonight, and it is a privilege uh, sharing uh, this discussion uh, on a piece of rather important history for Canada, which is uh, uh, not ignored, but uh, not uh, as well known as perhaps it should be. As what we're talking about here today, here's the big test, it works. We'll be talking about the Battle of the Atlantic, uh, as mentioned once again, the longest continuous campaign of the Second World War, which also involved, as you'll see towards the end, the only occasion since the War of 1812 when Canadian military personnel and Canadian civ uh, civilian personnel, our merchant mariners, died in the Canadian territorial waters under enemy action. So we'll be discussing all of this uh, rather quickly uh, in order to get to uh, perhaps a discussion period, a question period as, uh, as appropriate, and uh, we'll be proceeding from there. Now I have to assume, this being filmed and everything, I am stuck here at the podium. Is that correct? Yeah. Which is rather uncomfortable for me, being a French Canadian, I've got to use my hands, got to walk around, right? But I will try to stick to it, but at any rate, Indeed, the longest continuous campaign of the Second World War, which began on the 3rd of September 1939 with the first British vessel being sunk by German submarine, the SS Athena, on the very first day that Great Britain and the British Dominions uh, joined the war, uh, SS Athena departing Glasgow, uh, England, proceeding to Montreal, Quebec, uh, was sunk shortly after leaving the uh, British Isles uh, with 138 
as civilian deaths, 54 Canadians, 28 Americans, and, and a number of others. And then as, as we'll be discussing throughout the following years, extensive uh, hostilities throughout the North Atlantic and beyond. And with HMCS Esquimalt, the last vessel of the Royal Canadian Navy sunk uh, through enemy action on the 16th of April 1945, two weeks before the end of the war, right off the approaches to, Esquim uh, to Halifax Harbor, within sight of the shore, but very early in the morning, sunk through uh, a torpedo wing, sunk so fast, unable to send the distress call, uh, thus the uh, surviving members of the ship's company uh, were left floating out there for six hours and 40 of the 80 or so members of the ship's company died uh, that late in the war. But very lastly, on the 7th of May 1945, at 2300 hours, one hour prior to the actual ceasefire taking place in Europe, German submarines sank the SS Avonville Park, a cargo ship built in Canada, uh, owned by Canadian uh, authorities, but uh, operated by the British at the time, uh, was sunk. The last merchantman sunk during that war with two more men uh, losing their lives, as I said, an hour prior to the official end of hostilities uh, in Europe. And here's the piece of brilliance that came to mind this afternoon, as a matter of fact, as I was rushing through my PowerPoint. This slide used to be called the battle, the enemy. And I had the feeling I should change it to the opponent, which I hope is welcomed by our one gentleman, uh, our one German uh, uh, fellow warrior present tonight. The opponent indeed. Uh, the uh, Battle of the Atlantic is uh, very interesting in that sense that obviously Second World War, uh, the first time that this kind of uh, fighting occurred was during the First World War, 1914-1918. We have the same thing going on. Uh, the Western Front, there is nothing going on. Uh, not that there's nothing going on, but there's a stalemate on the Western Front. 1917, uh, the German takes the initiative of using this new weapon, the submarine, which uh, at the time was a very in, the, in its infancy, but very rapidly they realized the potential of strangling a country like Great Britain relying on its commercial uh, lines of communication. It needed merchant ships to come from throughout the dominions or throughout the empire, the North America, to feed it. Uh, literally, and uh, through the course of that one year, 1917 to 1918, there was a potential that was discovered for submarines to uh, critically impair the traffic of merchantmen from one uh, point to the other. Very interestingly, after the First World War, both the German side and the Allies, the Great Britain, Canada, in a sense, uh, the United States, did not really realize or accepted the lessons of the First World War. Very rapidly, they said, yeah, the, German, the, uh, the submarines were quite a threat during the First World War, and they, they indeed came close of strengthening Great Britain. Nevertheless, through technological developments during the interwar period, such as the ASDIC, the anti-submarine detection device of some sort, today it's known as a sonar, really, uh, we would be able to detect those and we would be able to neutralize the submarine threat so a clean war would occur again, were a war to occur at sea, i.e. big gun carriers, big battleships would front each other in such things and the uh, submarine threat would not be such a, uh, such of a concern. So Germany, the German Navy at the time, which was not directed by Admiral Karl Donitz, he was the director of submarines by the uh, beginning of the war, but the overall the German naval commander, uh, Admiral Rader, was a surface ship guy. He was, he believed in the big gun carriers and, and such things, and that's what they sent, they proceeded to uh, develop 
and, and such things. So they had some marines, but they did not put all their money on some marines. So at the beginning it was, we will deploy these surface ships, these big gun carriers, they would, just like during the French Anglo Wars of 1800, they would go and stop and intercept merchant, uh, merchant ships and strangle Great Britain. That was their primary weapon at the time. There was some controversy about it, uh, but that's what they were putting their money in. And there was this new thing, what was it called again? Oh yeah, the aircraft. Do we have uh, former flyers in the audience at all? Okay, I don't have to give them a hard time, that's great. Uh, so, but they did have that, but they did not have the German, Germany did not have a dedicated fleet air arm or maritime air and such things, so they had air bombers that could do the business, but they were not dedicated to that. Uh, a very efficient tool was the mine, the lowly mine, not sexy or anything like that, uh, but very effective. You could deploy mines from ships, from submarines, from aircrafts, and, a very, and they did exercise a very heavy toll on, on the merchant ships and warships on the Allied side. All you had to do was deploy mines of their ports and such things, very difficult to detect, very difficult to neutralize, uh, and they were used extensively off the, off the coast of uh, Griffin. But obviously, the, uh, the weapon that came to the fore during the Second World War was the summary. It is interesting to consider the term summary because contrary to today, even during the Second World War, the submarine remained a submersible torpedo boat versus a submarine as we consider it today. A submarine as a weapon to be used on the water to stay hidden, pursue its targets and launch torpedoes. Through the initial course of the Second World War, we still have the favorite mode, or the most effective mode to employ a German submarine was actually on the surface. They would use their submersible mode in order to hide, position themselves, but they were slower, they had a uh, short uh, ability to remain on the, on the water because of, of batteries and such things. The favorite mode was actually to position themselves while on the surface, then surface and attack uh, surface vessels, convoys and such things on the surface where they had the speed, usually at night, so they'd be less detectable and uh, they'd be able to do the business uh, from there. And that's when I need to move, but I will stay. So at the end of the day, the Battle of the Atlantic was a battle of numbers and signals. What, did I, what do I mean by that? It was a raw battle of the access needed to sink more, sh more merchant ships than the Allies were able to build and launch, just like the Allies had to neutralize or destroy more U-boats that they were able to build, launch, and operate. This was a raw battle of numbers. Germany understood that this was going to be a long battle you cannot exercise or impose an embargo uh, in a short period of time. You will not get through this in four or six months. And it was all about building, once again, on the Allied side, on the Allied side, merchant ships, and on the German side, U-boats. And deploy them and deploy them in order to reach a stage where you had enough to build up wolf packs. The one difference, which was very important for Admiral Donitz, who had drew up, who had grown up through the First World War as a submarine captain, during the First World War, their submarines were deployed as independent units, and they would find ships and they would sink them. In his mind, what Germany had failed to do during the First World War is to coordinate the movements of these various submarines, hence the institution of these wolf packs tactics, where not only did you need to put submarines out in the North Atlantic across the road of convoys, but you could maximize their employment by having a group deployed in a patrol line, and once one submarine detected a convoy, 
This submarine would signal it to the other member of the wolf pack, as well as to the headquarters back in Europe, and then the headquarters would be able to coordinate the movements of a number of submarines, get them concentrated onto a convoy, and then truly uh, um, uh, exercise uh, a great rate of uh, attrition on the convoys and such things. The one element that young Donitz, Donitz did not quite understood at the time, or did not seize upon, it, is that this required radio communication. Every day, submarines would signal their position. Were a submarine to detect a convoy, they would signal the detection, and then the headquarters in Europe would signal to the submarines, go to this latitude, longitude, and start attacking. And this is where this whole uh, enigma business came into being, the signals part. The donut system was based heavily on the trans on radio transmissions. Donuts believed that he would be okay as the Enigma was deemed to be unbreakable. Uh, the Allies, you've seen the movies and such things, the Allies were able to break Enigma, and the Allies were actually able to locate radio transmissions. Therefore, they were able to locate uh, German, Marines, uh, German submarines, uh, packs and such things, and uh, go in from there. Nevertheless, this was not the magic formula in terms of by 1942-43, Germans had built so many submarines, so many packs were out there, that the Allied tactic of simply redirecting a convoy from this heading to this heading in order to avoid one wolf pack would only take it into another one. Hence the continued difficulties uh, that the Allies were ex experiencing throughout these first years of the war. So, this was the setup of the Battle of the Atlantic. This was the uh, opponent the Allies had to face. What was the role of the lowly Canadian Navy through this whole uh, equation? Let's remember that, uh, once again, the Canadian Navy had been underfunded, badly exploited, abused, and such things, and it was down in 1939 to six destroyers, which means three destroyers per coast, uh, five coastal minesweepers and patrol traps, and uh, that was about the extent of the ships that could be used in a battle uh, such as the Battle of the Atlantic. Today, the Canadian Navy has around 9,000 members. At the time, there were 1,800 riggers, so actual RCN officers and NCMs. 300 RCNR or so, so Royal Canadian Naval Reserve, so these were uh, experienced sailors, they were merchant sailors and such things, and uh, they could uh, give some time to the uh, Navy and such things. And there were 1,400 Royal Canadian Naval Volunteer Reserve, the RCV, RCNVR. What uh, came to be known as the Wavy Navy. You can see their rank on, the, uh, on their sleeve there being dis displayed differently, source of great tension or issues, division between, uh, among the Navy and such things. But at the, at the end of the day, these were the numbers you had. But it is very interesting that within the next five years, we would draw from these numbers to eventually a total of 106,000 officers and sailors uh, between these three corps, and noticeably 83% of them would be from the wavy navy. So in theory the wavy navy were the, were the um, officers and NCMs who had no experience in the navy, who had never been to sea, were university students, uh, uh, apprentices, uh, and nevertheless they came to uh, to, to uh, do the business on behalf of the, uh, of the Royal Canadian Navy. And of course, I have to include 7,000 or so were RENS, the Women's Royal Canadian Naval Service, founded in 1942 uh, in order to supplement uh, uh, the, the RCN in various roles ashore, uh, but some of them were involved in this signals business. 
uh, and uh, in the various administrative uh, services uh, ashore, as well as um, as uh, nurses and, and such things. But it remains 1939, very small number. What did they have to do? So, so that very small number, what were they ready to do in 1939? And here we go back to uh, this concept I was talking about where navies, both on the Axis and the Allied side, were not really ready for the Second World War, for the Battle of the Atlantic that would unfold. Uh, once again, they believed that the submarine threat could be handled and uh, it would be back to the real business of battleships and such things facing each other and, uh, and going at it. So the very few numbers I'm talking about, the six destroyers of the Canadian Navy during the interwar period did not train, for the most part, did not train to go after submarines. They were trained to go after battleships. They were actually trained in torpedo attacks where we had this Jutland-like, oh, wrong button, the Jutland-like where you would have a main battle fleet of battleships and then you would have the small destroyers breaking through the main line, going onto the guns of the big battleships and trying to fire torpedoes at them, conducting surface torpedo engagements and doing what the real naval warfare should have been at the time, sinking big ships. That's what Canada was going to do. It didn't turn out that way. Again, no ASDICs, the first ASDIC or sonar was installed in a Royal Canadian Navy ship in 1937. That was the beginning. For those who have served in the Navy, you understand that the major new system takes years to both install, develop knowledge about, develop understanding of how it is to be used, its strengths and weaknesses and such things. So they were in no way ready uh, to, uh, to, uh, to launch into the uh, anti-submarine warfare business uh, in 1939. Hence my question about aviators. The Royal Canadian Air Force, they were involved, relatively speaking. So first, first World War, uh, it started in Great Britain. Great Britain had a uh, naval air service that started during the uh, during the First World War. Once again, eventually, by the end, by 1918, uh, Canada saw that there was a need for that too. And here, obviously, we're not talking about aircraft carriers, or we're talking about shore-based aircraft patrolling waters in order to detect submarines and such things. So, in Canada, it started. Actually, in September of 1918, this group here was actually trained in the United States, and this what, these were the initial uh, balbutiement of uh, uh, air units taking on anti-submarine taskings. But then again, there was this slight uh, uh, blip that occurred called 11 of November 1918, end of the war, uh, obviously Canada. Uh, started uh, divesting itself from uh, from defense issues and such things, and the Royal Canadian Naval Air Service was disbanded right away, under the understanding that the uh, soon to be named RCAF would assume responsibility for shore-based uh, patrol of Canadian waters. As as one could expect during the interwar period, the RCAF had other things on its mind and patrolling the coast for uh, for submarines and such things. Uh, they had grand ambitions of strategic bombings and doing the real business. Maritime trade protection was not very much forward on their mind. And uh, were I not filmed right now, I would draw a parallel to today's world where the current Royal Canadian Air Forces is responsible for maritime aviation in Canada, but I will not go there because I am being filmed. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, in 1939, they did, they did step up to the plate in terms of they had, uh, we had a number of squadrons of these flying, uh, flying boats, literally, but these were made, mainly meant to conduct surveillance of the coast for, once again, for large enemy surface vessels that would be coming to raid the coast and bombard 
um, harbors and such things, vice detecting submarines or let alone attacking submarines and such things. All this to say that Canada as a whole was not quite prepared for the challenge ahead. But then again, the challenge ahead in the early times, in the early stage of the uh, Battle of the Atlantic, was not necessarily as uh, challenging, I guess, as one can think of today based on the movies and such things. Earlier on, Germany was challenged too, in the sense of prior to May 1940, the offensive in the West and such things, they were the biggest problem for the German Navy. They were still confined to their bases. So their submarines still had to go around Great Britain in order to go and position themselves off the Western approaches and enter up the traffic there. This long transit meant fuel being expanded. Uh, the, once again, back to my uh, statement about the tension between Admiral Raider and Admiral Donitz. They did not that that many submarines during this initial period, but very much we were looking at the repeat of the First World War scenario, and this is 1917-18, is pretty much what happened. They were grouped just to the west of Great Britain, and they tried to stop what was going on. Now Canada, based on its very limited resources, did not escort convoys all the way across. Basically, we had forces based in Halifax, we would take them out to the Grand Banks, convoys would disperse from here, they would be given a meeting point across here where they would be picked up by Great Britain based escort. And there would be an Atlantic gap here where crossing our fingers they would be doing okay without a uh, formalized escort. This worked out okay in the early months of the war, subject to accepting the many losses and such things in terms of using the term okay but it became quite complicated after May 1940. So Germany invaded Norway, eventually they made it across Holland, Belgium, France. They started uh, pre-positioning uh, submarines up the East Coast. They could skip the British, uh, the British Isle uh, obstacle, I guess, and go and operate further to the west and very early, and very quickly, they, they discovered the gap that I was talking about. Uh, they moved beyond the escorts provided by the Western Approaches Command. They saw over here, that's the Atlantic, sorry. Uh, they saw that there was a gap before the Canadian escorts were taking them over on the other side. And they started operating there and exacted a very um, uh, dire uh, prices on these single ships or unescorted convoys that were trying to make their way to Great Britain. Based on this, Great Britain occupied Iceland, a bit of a complex relationship there. Iceland was part depending on Denmark at the time. Denmark had been occupied by Germany. So they went on there. Uh, and uh, a note to our fellow army uh, colleagues, the Canadian Army contributed to the Iceland garrison starting in Ju July of 1940, uh, supplementing British troops that were there. Uh, and at the same time, Britain asked Canada to assume responsibility for the overall defense of Newfoundland, Newfoundland not being part of Canada at the time. Uh, but as well, we established a, uh, the Newfoundland escort force uh, starting in May of 1941 in order to go and clean or nothing but close the gap I was talking about. So after 1941, we had a very complex escort system uh, in order to cover the whole of the North Atlantic. We basically had three segments to the escort of North Atlantic convoys. What do I mean by that? So local escorts would take ships from Halifax, let's say, to Newfoundland. These escort ships would then turn that over to other ships. They would go into Newfoundland, they would refuel, come out, pick up westbound convoys and take them to either uh, Newfoundland or after December 1941 to the United States. The Newfoundland escort force would take convoys 
along this route towards Iceland. They would break fuel in Iceland, take a westbound convoy, take them to Newfoundland. And the Western approaches vessels based in Great Britain, they would take them over from Iceland, bring them to Great Britain, and carry on from this cycle throughout the remaining years of the war. A very complex coordination uh, task, a very difficult task to fill in terms of having the right number and the right mix of escorts, uh, and which was made even more difficult by purely RCN issues. And by RCN issues, I would see the drawback of the spectacular increase of numbers I was talking about is not only do you need to produce new ships and man them, but you have to exercise those, those crews, which, uh, which we did not have the opportunity to do, really. So hence, all of the stories, all of the dramatic stories, really, of crews uh, being untrained, deploying, with very minimum understanding of what they had to do. And this is the drawback of the 83% of uh, RCNVR uh, individuals I was talking about, where you could have a Corvette deploying to sea, being at sea for a month, with one uh, officer to watch qualified individual, and all of the other guys having the barest of training. Uh, unavoidable in the sense of operational requirements was there, only the most minimal time could be given to training and then you had to deploy them. There was an expectation that you would learn on the job. I have learned on the job at the time, obviously people were dying on the job, yeah, a very dire uh, proposition obviously. Uh, very difficult to develop unit cohesion. And here, whether you're Army, Air Force, or Navy, you will understand, they would create a crew, they would put them on a boat, they would go out, do the business, they would come back, and those who had most distinguished themselves or gained some, any kind of experience would then be taken out in order to go and form the, the, uh, the, the, the basis of a new crew for a new boat. A, a very, uh, once again, a very challenging proposition. And here, a, a very interesting statement, if we go back to the, the toast of the day, uh, where the Canadian Navy developed a reputation for being too offensive, which in naval term, in Nelsonian term, is a good thing. You have to go and, uh, what did he say? No man can do very wrong by bringing his ship to the side of the enemy, or something to that effect, but the ASW business, the anti-submarine warfare business, is actually a primarily defensive thing, where you're escorting those convoys, you're exercising presence, you're dissuading uh, submarines from attacking you versus trying to detect one and go after it. And uh, a great many losses were incurred through uh, over-eagerness on the Canadian side to uh, go out and try to do the deed. So the Battle of the Atlantic unfolded, as I said, 1939 to 1945. It peaked, actually, in 1943, uh, where we had, during the first months of 1943, January to May 1943, is the time when you had the most German submarines deployed out in the Atlantic. Uh, but the Allies were getting on top of the game, and uh, there, was, there were dramatic uh, battles during that time which uh, eventually culminated in May of 1943 to such dire losses on the German side that although the battle was not won at the time, the, uh, uh, the point of uh, no return, I guess, for lack of a term, had been passed. But in the meantime, 74 years ago, in September 1942, the Gulf of St. Lawrence was closed to transatlantic shipping. These waters, obviously, Canadian territorial waters, were close to transatlantic shipping. What occurred there? Uh, on the one hand, one must admit that it was not a planned campaign. It was not donuts that said, I'm going to go into the St. Lawrence and cut it off, 
It was a number of submarine, of uh, German submarine commanders who, were, who happened to be operating off the east coast of Canada that did, that did a, a number of forays into the Gulf and St. Lawrence and then further into the river. But that found very uh, fertile soil in terms of their offensive. One must remember that at the time, uh, Canada had some local escorts based in Halifax. Canada had been asked to preposition most of this, most of its uh, uh, more serious or the more effective escorts in St. John's, and this was kind of a backyard where we had very few uh, vessels ready to do the business. It was not envisioned at the time that there would be a need to conduct anti-submarine operations in the Gulf and St. Lawrence and the river itself. So in that sense, the, uh, those few German commanders who took their submarines in there uh, demonstrated brilliance, which was augmented or supported by very challenging conditions from a tactical point where you have fresh water coming down the St. The Lawrence, mixing with salt water, and here we're talking about exercising uh, submarine detection, and there's a, based on physical uh, properties of salt and fresh water, very difficult to have those addic addicts or sonars I was talking about trying to reach them. So conditions were very favorable to, to the Germans. So over the course of three navigation seasons, so late 42, summer 43, and uh, spring of 44, uh, the Germans coming into Canadian waters and resulting in uh, some important losses uh, once again, uh, that were so serious in 42 in the very early stage for Canadian authorities to say that it is too dangerous to send ships here to go to Great Britain. Ships will uh, either land stuff there or Canada's industry will get their stuff there and they'll get to by train to Halifax and St. John, New Brunswick and then go up, go up, go up. End of the day, 24 ships were sunk in the Gulf of St. Lawrence and the, and the river itself, four Canadian warships, 20 uh, merchant ships, within, very often within sights of the Canadian shores, and uh, in a scenario or in a context where it was very diff difficult for the locals to understand what's going on, because obviously we're talking about uh, uh, stopping the news, sorry, uh, Censorship. So there was no announcement or anything, and then these populations all of a sudden would see ships blowing up and such things. And this is where the uh, personal aspects kicks in for me, uh, where I am from this very small town here in Matan. My grandparents are from a smaller town just to the east of it called Les Méchins. And in the summer of 1942, this ship here, do not know the name, a Norwegian ship was sunk right off the coast, and all of a sudden my grandparents who were living on the coast uh, that night had a bunch of Norwegians showing up on the shore. There was a, f a ship sinking and burning on the horizon, and they ended up hosting a number of these Norwegian sailors who obviously didn't speak English. My grandparents didn't speak English, and they were trying to sort out who was who, what happened, are you actually German? <laughs> a great many concerns. But nevertheless, once again, a very little understood battle that occurred on the very front steps of Canada and within our territorial waters. Uh, again, one, the first time since 1812 and never to be repeated since, and obviously, and obviously, uh, hopefully, never to be repeated uh, again. So what came out of this very challenging battle, both the Battle of the St. Lawrence and the larger Battle of the Atlantic, the Royal Canadian Navy was credited with escorting no less than 25,000 merchant ships who actually made it safely across to Great Britain. I did not research how many ships were lost under Canadian escort, uh, but there were a great many for sure. 31 enemy submarines were sunk through the action of Canadian ships or through collaboration of Canadian ships and others. Uh, 
uh, but again, I tip my, uh, my hat to the Royal Canadian Air Force. This takes up up to 50, as by the end of the war, the Royal Canadian Air Force did have, uh, or did assemble, very uh, impressive resources and procedures in order to conduct this uh, offshore business out at sea. <laughs> by the end of the war, we went from, once again, remember, six destroyers and five patrol traps, minesweepers, to 300 combatants uh, sailing in May of 1945. You'll hear other statistics, 500 ships in the Canadian Navy. It depends on how you add ships, do you put in the landing crafts and, and all of this stuff, but these are 300 what we call today major warships, serious warships that need a, a large complement, including one escort carrier, so we're in the uh, carrier business, two light cruisers, so that's the escort carrier here, cruisers here, uh, another cruiser that had that was fitted for anti-air uh, warfare, 20 destroyers, 65 frigates, 113 corvettes, uh, and down we go. So a very uh, serious navy, a navy specialized in anti-submarine warfare, with some capability to conduct other uh, other responsibilities and such things, and a navy that was getting ready to go to Japan. In 1945, by the spring of 1945, the bombs had not occurred yet, plans were being underway, just like in the other services, assembling a flotilla uh, to, for dispatch to Japan had uh, the war continued in that uh, realm. Now the cost. 14 warships lost to U-boats, 8 warships lost to accidents, and important stat statistics in terms of, it also uh, makes you realize that whether you're at war in peacetime, training uh, is important. When we're talking about accidents here, or you know, bad maneuvering between ships, ships being cut up, being cut into by other ships, ships running around, and, and such things. So this is why today we go out and we do, we do the business day in and day out and push the envelopes, we test our junior officers and push them in to uh, challenging waters to avoid that. 72 merchants, here we're talking about Canadian merchants, obviously a great many more overall, but these were uh, merchant ships uh, owned by Canadian authorities and businesses. As stated before, around 2,000 Royal Canadian Navy sailors were lost, around 1,600 merchant mariners Merchant mariners being guys who were doing the business until 1939, they were merchant mariners, and in 1939 the context changed when they just kept on going with their job and uh, were not getting uh, any kind of special uh, appreciations or anything like that. Again, I have to under underline here, 752 RCF air crews died. Uh, Fighting a submarine on the surface could be challenging, uh, especially in the later stage of the war. The German Navy had realized that aircraft were a very um, threatening uh, enemy. They had uh, they, were, they had uh, equipped the submarines with challenging air defenses, and a great many of those airplanes, while conducting attacks on surface submarines. Uh, we're taking up. And here's to my great shame. I struggled throughout the forenoon. I tried to get a number of Canadian Army gunners that were lost at sea. A great many merchant uh, ships were equipped after the beginning of the war with guns uh, for their self defense, and they were actually attributed or uh, crewed uh, by uh, Canadian Army gunners who uh, obviously were uh, part of this. Part of this uh, this number of ships that were sunk at a time and that paid the uh, ultimate price. A bit of a uh, whirlwind talk through a very uh, long and challenging campaign. Um, I hope you, uh, you did understand or you did get a, a bit of an introduction to it all. Uh, I would I would love to keep talking. Uh, I have been 
encouraged to expand on this uh, subject that uh, fascinates me. But in the interest of the overall audience here, I will give you the choice to either talk about it or bring it to an end or uh, expand more on it. The floor is yours. Excellent stuff there. You know. uh, does anybody have any questions? Yes, over here. Yes, sir. Brian Berlant. Um, I have a question. I was noticing when you were mentioning 300 combatants, like the vessels. Yeah. Were there any, I didn't see any submarines. Did the Canadians have any submarines in the second? At the time, no. Okay. We did not fight the war with submarines and such things. Uh, we exercised against submarines. It's very important to have submarines to exercise your, to practice and train against them. But uh, after, on or about the 8th of May, we actually gained or acquired two German submarines that became part of the Royal Canadian Navy. Um, one was and one of them was Werner's. <laughs> yes, we had Canadians in our end <laughs> but that is correct, and that's another, so after the war we acquired two uh, German submarines, we did some research with them and such things, but during the war there were Canadian sailors that served in British submarines uh, doing the business over there, uh, and, uh, and that met uh, some success. British submarines were mainly involved, obviously, in waters closer to Germany and in the Mediterranean, uh, as obviously Germany didn't have much uh, Transatlantic uh, traffic going through, uh, but uh, another very challenging piece of it all. And uh, they participated both in neutralizing enemy, sorry, opponent traffic of their coast, and operations such as landing agents, uh, conducting recce, uh, and these kind of operations, which are very similar to what our submarines do today. Are there any other questions? Yes. Captain, uh, my uh, father was uh, a Wavy Navy captain towards the end of the war of HMCS Inganish, the minesweeper. I've never quite understood what role minesweepers play in convoys. Can you expand on that a little? Uh, they were not meant to be convoy escorts, but they were a ship that had a gun up forward and that could be fitted with depth charge aft, so they were good to go. Uh, it was. It was that dire at the time that every single hull had to be used. So their role obviously is not convoy escort. They were meant to be minesweepers and such things, uh, but they contributed to the overall effort. And the Canadian 12 Algerines built in Port Arthur were all built as minesweepers for the Royal Navy, but were taken on by the Canadian Navy, and they were all ocean escorts during the war. They were a little bit larger than Corvettes, both the same, relatively the same. They were only ocean escorts in western local escort out to the mid-ocean group or down to New York and so on. But those 12 were all just ocean escorts. They were minesweepers built for the Royal Navy as minesweepers. They used theirs as minesweepers, but we used them as ocean escorts. And then about half the vanguards were built as minesweepers and used on D-Day and afterwards. And the other ones were used again in the St. Lawrence, particularly in that battle that the captain mentioned, where mostly Bangor escorts, and they were used as escorts, not minesweepers. Mm -hmm. We had them as minesweepers, we used some of them, but a lot of them were just used as escorts as well. We actually had yachts used yeah. as escorts. Uh, <laughs> a great many, but certainly a great many of the larger yachts, the big yachts, were were mobilized at the beginning of the war, were fitted with either a gun or depth charges astern, and everything that could carry some kind of weapon out at sea would be mobilized to do the business. Because once again, it brings you back to my point where the Allied navies were had, had entirely under underestimated the uh, submarine challenge, and uh, they would they would just sail whatever could sail across the Atlantic, whether it was meant to cross the Atlantic or not, to do the business. Yeah, uh, one, two more questions, that's it. Yeah? I'm, uh, I'm from Newfoundland, and growing up in St. John's, just outside St. John's, uh, the role and the participation of the military, the presence of the military in St. John's was very, very obvious. 
but I grew up at a time when I didn't know much about it. And I was curious if you could tell us, tell me a little bit about what resources were in St. John's for the Battle of the Atlantic. Mm, very little. A <laughs> <laughs> ship, shipyard. That's right. So no, it was. Uh, but, but, but it was a challenge. So until so 1939, the war starts. Canada takes over the uh, the defense of Newfoundland as a whole. Saint John is not envisioned as a potential future naval base, uh, and it was the capital of Newfoundland. It was a commercial fishing port that had some resources. But when I was talking about the establishment of the Newfoundland Escort Force in May of 1941, that was the biggest challenge was right there. There were very few local resources available. So both Great Britain, well both uh, the three, Great Britain, America, before it joined the war, May 1941, it's not a war yet, and Canada had to dispatch a number of ships, orders to expand the, uh, the fuel capacity uh, of St. John's. Uh, depot ships were sent there to provide barracks and uh, repair, shop, repair shop. There was a single, I believe it was the only dry dock in the island, was in St. John's, so that thing started going 24 and 7. Uh, but from a true sailor's perspective, the biggest problem was the lack of entertainment. I was wondering if you could pull the question because. Uh, Hughes is going to be down in the bar afterwards and would love to entertain all the, the questions at that time because I know some people have to leave early and everything. Because I might mention just to do with your your army gunners as, as Dems defensively at court mention ships. There were 22 Canadian infantry that were seconded to be Dems in 1941 when the Brits realized they had the ships and the guns but not enough seamen to man them. So they asked the Canadian Army, who were swanning around doing a lot of training in England and doing nothing much that they enjoyed, all right, can we get some volunteers? So there were 22 under a, a lieutenant from the 48 Highlanders that formed when, as gunners. They were, all they had to do was be able to be trained in a, in a Bren gun and take the Bren gun with them. And there were 22 at least, or there may have been more, but I can identify 22. They came from such as the different the regiment down in, in uh, the HTPs, the 48, the 20, the uh, Van Dues, and a few like that, and twos and threes. The volunteers were Dems gunners until mid 43, by which time the Navy realized they could handle it themselves, or they became Army gunners from the artillery because the British formed three Army regiments for Dems gunners. But those 22 I know were infantry regiment soldiers. But most of them went back, I thought not all of them, to their, uh, to their regiment. This has been another in the ongoing series of podcasts brought to you as an educational service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. You can keep abreast of our web offerings as well as our live events by visiting our website at www.rcmi.org. Once again, this is Eric Morse saying thank you for being with us and good night.